I recently revisited the original Tomb Raider, one of my comfort blanket games, where I was surprised to find myself embroiled in a personal game of chess against the game's level designers, those being Heather Gibson, Neil Boyd, and Toby Gard. More so than in any other game, I could feel the creative team anticipating my moves, countering them, and shouting gotcha in my ear. Sometimes it didn't matter how cautious I was or what tools I used to foresee and avoid my own death. Heather, Neil, and Toby were one step ahead of me. And with every challenge I did clear, the team immediately upped the ante. I could feel them going, okay, let's see how you deal with this. It's something that could absolutely become off-putting and frustrating if not delicately balanced, yet for the most part, I found myself engaged throughout. You will die a lot. Seriously, I have so many deaths captured that I'm overwhelmed with choices for footage to accompany this sentence. Even so, Tomb Raider has that rare just one more go appeal. I was consistently motivated to one-up the people who made this game. It's a unique feeling that not even later entries in the same franchise have been able to recapture. Before we explore that magic, the times it works and the times it fails horribly, I should mention that the footage you'll see is from the Sega Saturn release. That's the version I grew up with, that's the version I'm nostalgic for, that's the version I see in my mind when I think about Tomb Raider. In addition to looking very different to its PlayStation and PC counterparts, it also performs very… let's be kind and say uniquely. There are areas where the frame rate can get as low as 10 FPS. The frame pacing, that is the length of time between new frames, is also horribly inconsistent, and that will be reflected in this review's footage. There will be a full version comparison at the end of this video, but for now just keep that in mind as you're watching. This is also one of my longer videos. It turns out I had a lot to say about the original Tomb Raider. I've used YouTube's chapter function to break things down for you guys and help you bookmark, but here's a quick list of timestamps for convenience. I do recommend watching the whole thing, but I also respect you may have limited free time and shit to do today. Speaking of time, no the segues are never going away. I want to establish the context this game released in, as I feel that plays a significant part in explaining the team's design decisions, as well as why the fanbase treasures this game, especially in Europe. Tomb Raider came out when I was just seven years old. I remember it being the Christmas present on everyone's list that year. It felt like everyone at school was playing it, even our teacher. I distinctly remember a conversation with him about how to finish the Colosseum level. It turned out he had missed a block you could pull out that reveals a lever. In a sense, I was the odd one out, owning the Saturn version. Everyone else seemed to have the PlayStation release. I did eventually pick up that PlayStation release, but I couldn't tell you when, where, or why. I assume I would have been older, as all of my childhood memories are of that Saturn copy. Either way, me and everyone I knew at the time had our collective minds blown by this game. We were obsessed. Bear in mind that this was 1996. For PAL territories, the PlayStation and Saturn were only around a year old, and the Nintendo 64 wouldn't arrive on our shores until 1997. Yes, really. In Europe, the Saturn version of Tomb Raider launched before the first Crash Bandicoot, while the PlayStation and PC versions came out alongside the Orange Marsupial's debut. Japan and America already had Super Mario 64, 
but us Brits wouldn't get our hands on the genre-defining 3D platformer until March of 1997. For many of us, Tomb Raider was our introduction to 3D gaming. We had simply never seen anything like it before. That alternate timeline for our region no doubt had a massive impact on how we viewed this game, yet I rarely see our perspective and experience being represented in reviews and retrospectives of Tomb Raider. It's one of many reasons I wanted to make this video. Lara seemingly became an icon overnight. She was everywhere. So much so that future games would include merchandise catalogues with order forms. In particular, I remember owning some of the toys, and there was a series of LucasAid adverts that really stand out when I think about her various sponsorships and brand deals. You could say she was the first video game character to become an A-list celebrity. Even friends and relatives who don't usually play games knew who she was. It was insane. I don't think I've ever seen a video game character push through to the mainstream pop culture so successfully and unapologetically before or since Lara Croft. Sure, Sonic made one hell of a dent in the public's collective conscious, supposedly being more recognisable than Mickey Mouse at one point, but adults wrote the blue blur off. He was seen as a children's mascot. Lara appealed to my teenage cousins, my uncles, and my teachers. Playing the game in the context of that time period, during the height of Lara Mania, definitely added a sense of excitement. Gaming had been a kid's hobby, something I could only talk to a small circle of people about. Now, it was the bleeding edge of home entertainment. This game, alongside other efforts by titles including Wipeout to target older audiences, suddenly made my hobby cool. That certainly favourably colours my perception of the game itself and its expertly crafted level design. <laughs> Tomb Raider has a quiet beauty. It's a game that's happy to leave you alone with itself. There's an almost serene sense of isolation. While you can't get any further removed from modern civilization, you do get to be up close and personal with what remains of a long gone society. It's an experience that's simultaneously warm and intimate, while also being cold and deadly. You've got to work for your sense of wonder and discovery. Tomb Raider levels are purposely obtuse puzzle boxes for you to figure out. Lara is mostly silent. You get the odd musical sting, but otherwise the only sounds are ambient noises. It really feels like you're the first person in hundreds of years to step foot in these locations. There are no hints, no guides, you're entirely on your own, except for two, count them, two instances where the camera focuses on your path forwards. Tomb Raider's settings afford it unique advantages in terms of immersion and suspension of disbelief. Many video games fall into one of two camps. Full on, unapologetically video gamey. These locations do not make sense and could not be lived in, with the alternative being a more realistic and grounded approach. Lara, however, finds herself almost uniquely positioned to enjoy the best of both worlds. Tombs are made to protect the dead and their possessions from grave robbers. These were dangerous places when they were new, never mind their now dilapidated state. Having these man-made structures that are purpose-built to keep people out provides the level designers with a fantastic playground to believably throw extreme challenges at you. The levels are even built on a grid-based system. It's believably artificial, suitably alien, and far removed from your typical action game. There are even times where it borders on feeling like a board game or a tabletop adventure 
rather than a video game. Even getting from point A to point B can be a puzzle in itself. Most levels end just a few feet from where they began, but require you to get a key, solve a puzzle, or take the long way around. In the very first level, you encounter a gate and spend the majority of your time taking a largely linear but massive diversion to get to the other side of it. After the first stage's somewhat guided tour, the second stage massively opens up. You're in a central chamber with various rooms and paths branching out from it. The door to the next area is nearby, but finding the key to it will loop you around a series of challenges. What's really striking here is the sheer number of distractions. The pool in the middle of the room, which commands your focus and attention? That's entirely optional, simply leading to two of the level's secrets. There are even areas of this chamber that serve no purpose, they're just there to throw you off. This is followed by ascending two towers filled with platforming skill checks to open a door forward where you may be unfortunate enough to discover that you missed a key item. See, the room where you collected the key for that first door also contained the key for the level's final door. If you missed it, you're backtracking through pretty much the entire level, but you can disable certain traps to make it easier, and running back, you realise just how indirect Lara's original route was. Finding keys, solving puzzles, and pulling switches may have meant it took 20 minutes to get this far, but running back to the start of the stage for the key is a two minute leisurely jog. You spend most of your time in this game being diverted sideways, away from the main path, just to overcome whatever's blocking it and open up your route forwards. You really are fighting for every inch of progression. This stage also teaches you that switches can't always be trusted, and that the game is more than happy to pull the rug out from under you. You're relatively safe this time, but it's a recurring theme that results in some later gotcha moments. Still, you could argue that points A and B are relatively clearly defined and obvious to the player in this second stage. The Lost Valley, the third level, strips that away too. The level exit is behind this waterfall, just a stone's throw from where you started. The thing is, you won't know that as a new player. What you do know is that there's a path to the left and a path to the right. Going left will see you eventually arrive at a broken mechanism that's missing some gears, while going right will likely see you find at least one of the three missing gears. Either way, it's immediately obvious to the player that they need to fix this machine, even if they're unsure what that machine does. The gears change the water flow, draining a stream you were previously jumping over, so naturally you follow it to see what's changed and, oh hey, there was an opening behind this waterfall. Neat. My issue with this level is that it's largely split in two. The area with the missing gears doesn't really interact with the area housing the machine. They even look entirely different. They're separated by this waterfall which, while an impressive centerpiece, discourages travel between them. They might as well be two separate miniature levels. There is an objectively optimal, efficient, and correct choice at the first fork. Go right, get the gears, come back, fix the machine. If you go to the machine first, all you've done is waste your own time as you can't use it without the gears anyway. Every repeat player goes right. Now what I do love this level for is its introduction of dinosaurs. Something that rarely gets brought up is how supernatural and weird the first Tomb Raider game gets. Sure, things start out fairly grounded, fighting bats, wolves, and bears, but in this level, without warning or explanation, we get raptors and a goddamn T-Rex. I've gushed about this T-Rex before, but it bears repeating. 
One of my greatest video game memories is being blindsided by two raptors before cautiously pressing on into the valley ahead, not being able to see anything other than a black abyss thanks to the limited draw distance. Then the battle music starts playing, the screen starts shaking, I tense up, and a massive T-Rex comes barreling around the corner roaring at me. And you have options here. You can directly take it on, but that doesn't always end well. You can cheese it by hiding in the caves and firing cheap pot shots at it from safety, my usual go-to. Or you can try to avoid and run around it, which can make for some hair-raising moments. The confidence to put an enemy this big in such an early 3D game and let the player handle it however they want is just fantastic. This T-Rex was a key talking point when the game came out, so much so that Tomb Raider sequels would also include them. I distinctly remember a rumour that the T-Rex's vision was based on movement, but I couldn't remember where it came from. I assumed we were just misinformed by Jurassic Park. But then I found a copy of the strategy guide that me and my friends actually owned as kids, and lo and behold, the strategy guide itself claims that the T-Rex's vision is based on movement. Now, as an adult, I appreciate that's probably just a throwaway pop culture reference, a board writer having fun. But as a kid, I took that guide as gospel and, uh, yeah, that ended about as well as you'd expect for me. The dinos would stick around for the following level, the Tomb of Qualapec, before disappearing. It's never explained, no one comments on it in-universe, Lara just shows up, blasts them, and moves on without batting an eyelid. This stage does tease another supernatural element. If you get close to this mummy, it falls towards you as if trying to attack. This is an early glimpse of later enemies, these Lovecraftian crimes against nature, which for some reason explode on death, who are much more persistent. These skinless horror shows dominate the second half of the game, but unlike the T-Rex, are actually built up to and given context within the story. But we're getting way ahead of ourselves. From this point onwards, the basic structure of almost every stage is one large hub area, usually an impressive set piece, an obvious exit that can't be used or accessed yet, and a bunch of challenge rooms that help you open or reach that exit. Many of the stage designs become circular or wind back in on themselves, something that, thinking about it now, probably influenced the early Ratchet and Clank games, where its multiple paths often spit you back out where you began, but now you have a new gadget or MacGuffin that you needed. We really start to see this as Lara moves on from Peru, to Greece. St. Francis Folly has a central tower, leading to rooms named after various gods, which each house one of the four keys Lara needs to escape. The Colosseum basically sees you running clockwise around various tests to get a single key for a single door. Meanwhile, the cistern has three doors with three keys back to back. By the time we reach Egypt, we have Inception-level hubs within hubs. Get two trinkets to open the Sphinx so you can reach another area with the key through a door back in the very corridor you started in. We don't see Linear Gauntlet's return until nearer the end of the game where, instead of curiously exploring, Lara's very much racing to catch up with the main villain. I especially appreciate that most levels start where the previous one ended. You will be on the other side of that door, emerging from that pool of water, or even falling down that shaft. There are even levels where you can see parts of the previous stage, or where you briefly return to an area from a past level. You can easily see and track your progress visually. You can get your bearings and place yourself within the larger tomb. The worlds are very cohesive, and without 1996's technological limitations or the need for loading screens, 
each of the game's four main locations could be massive singular levels. I wouldn't be surprised if there are mods or fan games out there that stitch them together, and if so, I would love to play them. But that navigation, while engaging and intriguing, can be unnecessarily awkward, clunky, and difficult. In fact, the way you move Lara around may be a deal breaker for some of you. We are dealing with tank controls, which I'm known to be a fan of. Up always moves Lara forwards in the direction she's facing, completely independent of where the camera may be looking. Down will always cause Lara to hop backwards, while left and right turn Lara, again relative to the direction she's facing, not the direction the camera is facing. Using these directions in combination with the jump button will result in a variety of leaps, with their usefulness depending on the situation. There's a strong level of consistency here. The same jump will always move Lara the same distance, thanks to the grid-based level design. You need to pick and choose the right one for the task. You have a very clear understanding of your options, but it's also a very rigid and inflexible system. Lara's moves are also tied to animations, so if you want to do a running jump, you have to be able to take at least two steps first, otherwise Lara will run herself straight off the ledge, often to her death. This gets frustrating when you need to do a standing jump, which is forwards and jump at the same time, because the game might read it as a running jump, which is holding forwards and then pressing jump, again resulting in Lara running off a cliff or high ledge. You do have some countermeasures for this. You can hold a button down to make Lara move slowly, which allows you to position her more precisely and also prevents her from walking off an edge. Similarly, you can shuffle her side to side to line yourself up with switches and items. There's a grab button to pull yourself up ledges and save yourself when your jump is just that little bit short. Admittedly, its precision can cause it to all end up feeling a little awkward and fiddly though. For example, if you want to jump up and grab the edge of a platform above you, you have to slowly walk Lara into place and then make the jump. Even then, you will probably miss. It has to be pixel perfect, meaning you'll often take multiple stabs at it while screaming JUST GET UP THERE at your TV. You spend a lot of time nudging Lara and readjusting her position, often walking to the edge of a platform, hopping back, and then doing a running jump just to make sure you have the room. There were countless times, however, where all of the caution and patience in the world couldn't save me from the game misreading my inputs. Ultimately, it felt like I was feeding suggestions to Lara, and then she was deciding whether to listen to me or not. Granted, some of this may be tied to the Saturn version's performance issues that I briefly mentioned earlier, and we'll explore in more detail during the version comparisons. Now the game does teach you all of this, in a tutorial in Lara's house that many players will skip because it's not the first option on the main menu and we're a largely stupid and impatient species who might not even realise that this game has a tutorial. They clearly only wanted to record the voiceover once, despite shipping the game on multiple platforms, so Lara will often say, use the action button, or press the jump button. That doesn't help me when I don't know what the jump button is, especially on PC where, just look at these controller mappings! Control is action, alt is jump, while that massive spacebar right there next to it is to unholster and reholster your weapons. Running is on the arrow keys, not WASD, and whose idea was it to implement page up and page down? This was definitely the Wild West when it came to controlling a character in a 3D space. Again, the UK, where this game was developed, wouldn't get the Nintendo 64 or Mario 64 for a good four to five months after Tomb Raider released. 
That said, I strongly encourage you to use a program like XPadder to play the PC version with a controller. This is my configuration, mimicking the PS1 version's layout, if you want to borrow it. On the plus side, Lara can also swim, and weirdly, her movement feels far more fluid, natural, and intuitive in the water than they do on land. In most games, the swimming controls are awful, but here they're actually something of a highlight. How does that happen? There is some early 3D jank to contend with, with the hitboxes being a little, uh, unforgiving, shall we say. But thankfully, for a good stretch of the game, that awkward move set, that slowly does it mentality, thinking about and planning your moves before you execute them, serves the game well. It's already quiet, isolating, and understated in its approach. You could imagine Lara being as apprehensive as you are. She is not free-running or parkouring around these tombs, half of which look like they could crumble if you so much as sneezed on them. These are dangerous environments. It makes contextual sense for her to be careful with her footing. Generally, the game respects this and doesn't ask you to do anything too strenuous. I went in fearing this set of jumps across flaming platforms in Palace Midas, and was surprised it was simpler than I remembered. The difficulty level naturally ramps up, with the platforming areas surrounding the Sphinx being a reminder that, sometimes, the hard part is getting Lara safely back down to the ground after climbing up high. The game often presents a fair challenge overall. Well, until the game says jump over this gap, run across this collapsing floor, dodge a swinging blade, outrun two boulders, and make this jump over lava in one smooth motion. But that is one of the final stretches of the final level, a level where they placed a small medipack on that first boulder ramp just to catch you out and laugh maniacally at you where the solution to dodging one of the boulders is to counterintuitively jump towards it, a point where the developers are throwing everything, including the kitchen sink at you, in a demanding final exam. Even once the final boss is down, the stage still throws one last platforming section at you. Depending on your personality, this finale will either feel like a thrilling and very personal one-on-one -on -one tug of war with the level designers, as you constantly try to one-up and outdo each other with ever-escalating stakes, or an unfair, frustrating mess of outdated 90s game design philosophies that only served to prevent people beating Tomb Raider as a weekend rental from Blockbuster. Thankfully, I fall into the prior camp, and that final leg is one of the game's highlights. It's rare to feel the level designer's presence like this. It's as if they're sat on the couch next to you, watching your moves and designing the next section in real time as you play, teasing and taunting you with an, alright, yeah, you did okay there, but let's see how you handled this. The other part of that equation, which I had to respect, was that it was at least fairly obvious as to what the game was expecting of me or asking me to do. There were some limited exceptions where the game frustrated me, though. St. Francis Folly is the only stage where Lara starts with her guns already equipped, because the game immediately jumps you with two lions or tigers or whatever these are supposed to be, then three gorillas, then Pierre shoots at you for a bit, and then you're in a vertical shaft where one wrong move means you'll fall to your death. Not that it will stop more animals chewing on your corpse, while Pierre adds some bullets to your hide for good measure. This is alongside challenge rooms that will electrocute you, crush you, and drown you without hesitation. I would usually describe Tomb Raider as a comfort blanket game, a game I know very well, often return to, and have a degree of mastery at. While capturing footage for this review, I had a very harsh reminder that that's not true. I do return to Tomb Raider a lot, but usually it's only for those first four levels. I tend to get to St. Francis Folly and go, you know what, I'm good, 
I've had my fill, often ending my run right there. For that reason, I think it's my least favourite level in the game. In fact, I'm far more familiar with the first and final legs of the adventure than I am Greece or Egypt. The system is placed maybe a third of the way through the game. You have to raise and lower water levels, everybody grown together, to collect keys for the series of doors leading towards the exit. If you do not raise and lower the water in the correct order, you can cause yourself to have to repeat a massive chunk of the stage, only now without the safety net of the game's single-use save points. Well, on console at least. The PC version does support quick saves, but we'll talk about that in the version comparison. I should know I made exactly that mistake, and it added a good 40 minutes and multiple deaths to my run. Then, after outstaying its welcome as is, the level doesn't have the courtesy to end after you open those doors. Instead, you'll be placed on a chessboard, attacked, and left with a switch that opens a door to... more enemies and a seemingly empty room. The actual route forward is to pull this camouflaged block and head into the resulting gap. Here come the comments saying I'm a noob who missed a blatantly obvious secret or something. Likewise, in the Tomb of Tihokan, I had difficulty finding the switch for the final door. It's underwater, and I swam around searching for a good while before accidentally happening across it. You have to pull up, but the camera doesn't really show you there's an area where you can surface above you, you just have to awkwardly feel it out. Finally, we have Natla's Mines, a very open level where your guns are taken away from you and you're tasked with finding free fuses to get them back. It can be difficult to find the first thread to pull on, especially if you don't realise that A, there is an area behind this waterfall, and B, while other doors require you to pull switches, including an identical gate in the same area, this one just opens as you approach it. Even once you're armed again, finding the path forwards, dropping yourself from this ledge onto a small outcropping below, can be seen as a bit of an ask. To be fair, some of these elements do recur throughout the game, and the player should come to expect this kind of puzzle. I mentioned that the Lost Valley asks you to find three gears at the opposite end of the level. St. Francis Folly demands collecting four keys from challenge rooms branching off of a central tower, and the Obelisk of Carmoon has you completing sections that bring you to different sides of a central pillar to collect four trinkets. The thing is, these instances give you much more guidance. It's easier to find that first thread, which unravels everything else. Palace Midas, where you need three gold bars to exit the stage, even has a giant sign that spells out the stage's requirements. Natla's Mines, by comparison, just sort of leaves you to it and says, good luck. It's just that step too far into being annoyingly obtuse. Once you know the solution, future playthroughs of the stage feel much more fluid, but it will put the brakes on hard for a first timer or someone who hasn't returned to the game in a long time. Yes, that is teasing a later point. Another area where the game doesn't always set clear or fair expectations comes in the form of secret areas. These are parts of the levels that provide you with health, ammo, and sometimes even new weapons for going off the beaten path. The majority made me feel smart as a player. I usually had a moment of, I wonder if, followed shortly by, this is either going to be amazing or go horribly wrong. I enjoyed seeking them out. Some of them require a degree of mastery over the controls that borders on ridiculous, though. You have this trick in St. Francis Folly, where it took me far too many attempts to nail the jumps required to climb vertically. In the Colosseum, you're tasked with performing this perfect set of jumps on a time limit in order to get the magnums before a hidden door closes. In the team of Tehoken, you have to jump off a ramp 
to a hidden platform while the camera is completely obscuring your view. Seriously, if I didn't know this was here from my childhood, then I'd have never found it and then perform a perfect sequence of leaps across crumbling platforms. Your reward for performing this Herculean feat is a meager single clip of Magnum and Uzi ammo. The Uzis are part of the game's most infamous secret. You can find them sitting on an invisible platform requiring a leap of faith. And on the Sega Saturn, I swear they're almost impossible to see, even when you already know exactly where to look. Grabbing them also spawns in two flying enemies that will try to knock you off to your death. So, you know, that feels completely fair, reasonable, and measured. Pretty much all of the weapons are secrets, rewards for exploration. Their inclusion in the game is teased as you collect the ammo for these guns long before you find the shotgun, magnums, or uzis. By the end of the second level, it's possible to have bullets for every gun you'll eventually find. You got this ammo as a reward for being curious, so you're incentivized to continue trying to reach areas you probably shouldn't be able to. As early as the third level, you'll find that first gun too, picking up a shotgun from a skeleton. I actually really like the inclusion of corpses in some levels. Explorers have been here before you, but this is as far as they got. I wonder what killed them, and whether you'll survive where they failed. It's also as early as the third level that the game starts to occasionally punish exploration. Going down this path doesn't lead to any secrets or pickups, just a wolf's den of extra enemies. There will be a few times where the level designers lay out a route that looks like it might be interesting or lead to a secret, but it's just a trap, or a dead end, or a distraction from forward progression. It can lead to thinking, do you want me to explore or not? Fortunately, even if you do miss these hidden weapons, you will have all of them by the end of the game. Earlier, I said that the Natlas Mines level takes all of your weapons away from you. Well, you will fight three human enemies to get them back, including, yes really, a kid on a skateboard. Each of them drops one of the game's three extra guns, and this happens regardless of whether you had previously collected them or not. Personally, I prefer finding the guns first, as it implies they stole your shotgun and you're stealing it back. Otherwise, it's just... Oh hey, cool, a shotgun, without the same meaning. I remembered late game enemies being tough and ammo being scarce, so I hoarded ammo and used the shotgun, magnums, and Uzi sparingly as if I was playing Resident Evil, only to reach the final stretch of the game with thousands of rounds for pretty much everything. Oops. I suppose I should elaborate on how combat works in this game. When her guns are drawn, Lara will automatically target enemies, and the action button shoots. You start the game with Lara's signature twin pistols that have infinite ammo, while everything else only has as many bullets as you can scavenge. The combat can best be described as clunky. The auto-targeting can have some strange ideas about what the biggest threat is, Lara will keep shooting at corpses, so if there are multiple enemies you have to stop firing, let the auto-aim find a new target, and then start blasting away again. Meanwhile, the camera is, uh... Let's go with vomit-inducingly drunk off its ass. For most encounters, you are better off getting up high, as most enemies can't climb, and killing everything below you. The AI will run away in these situations, but they'll be back. They always come back. It does become a problem when enemies start being able to shoot back. You often have to get into a rhythm, jumping or running around the enemy to avoid their projectiles. The optimal strategy for even the very late game bosses is to simply run or jump in a circle while holding fire and hoping for the best. One of the most dangerous things enemies can do is knock you off a high ledge or, uh... Huh, through a wall. Look at that. 
This makes many enemies more frustrating or annoying than they are deadly. I would say the limited encounters with other humans are probably the worst example. Their aim is spot on, they're all bullet sponges, they're surprisingly nimble, and crossing paths with them will eat away at your supply of health kits. Of Tomb Raider's three pillars, platforming, puzzles, and combat, combat is sadly the weakest. It's something I end up tolerating as a minor inconvenience rather than something I actively enjoy and engage with. Enemies don't drop health or ammo, there is no experience or leveling up, so there's very little incentive to take foes on unless you absolutely have to. That said, the magic of the game's other elements are so strong that I think it more than makes up for this one weak spot. Okay, yeah, look, I ragged on the platforming, I know, for all of my whining, trust me, I do genuinely adore this fucking game. In fact, one of the things that really stands out to me is Tomb Raider's unique aesthetic. Every area of the game is distinct. The environment helps to tell the story. Items aren't just decorative, they imply details about how these ancient civilizations lived. The game is strikingly colourful. There's a lot of cracked, peeling paint. The tombs themselves are grand and ornate affairs that show how much the people revered their rulers. There are a lot of little details here, like how we can see where the water usually reaches to erodes and discolors certain walls. I particularly like the level of saturation and contrast in the Saturn version, but again, more on that in the version comparisons. The game isn't afraid to defy conventions or surprise you either. By the end, you're exploring full-on body horror hallways of pulsating flesh and sinew. Now, to avoid spoilers, I've purposefully not named the final level until now, but if you don't already know, where do you think this is supposed to be? Spoilers in 3, 2, 1. Would you have guessed Atlantis? Yeah, the lost sunken city is not only above water, it's crafted out of seemingly organic tissue. I'm genuinely unsure whether the environment is alive, and to this day, very few locales have made as strong of an impression on me as this version of Atlantis. I think the variety and level of detail here is outstanding for 1996. I was shocked to see MIP mapping implemented, a technology that changes a texture's level of detail based on its distance from the camera. You can even turn MIP maps off in the PC version. While the technique technically dates back to 1983, having been pioneered by Lance Williams, I didn't expect to see it in such an old video game especially not an early 3D game. I had previously thought that the level of detail or LOD techniques in 1998's original Spyro the Dragon, where entire models are swapped for lower polygon versions when they're far away from the camera, was the first of its kind and a landmark innovation for gaming. This proves me wrong. I guess I don't know my own ignorance sometimes. Likewise, the seldom used music, especially the title theme, can be soothing, mysterious, and enchanting. The battle theme is harsh and gets your blood pumping, and I truly believe the restraint with which the limited music selection is used only serves to amplify the impression they make. When it kicks in, it kicks in for a reason. The presentation in this game is one of the most thoughtful, curated and impressive efforts that I have ever seen in gaming. These are sights and sounds to behold. I think, rather I hope, that by this point I've made a pretty strong case for why you, as a player, should be incentivized to pick up and play the original Tomb Raider. But what's motivating our leading lady? What's the story here? Keeping spoilers to a minimum, as Lara Croft, you'll travel across four continents, hunting down three pieces of an ancient artifact known as the... 
Uh, let's see here. Sion? Skion? Skion? You and that driveling piece of the Skion, you want to keep it so bad? I'll harness it right up your- Thank you, the Skion. Lara is portrayed as an anti-hero here. She makes it very clear that she's playing for sport. She's okay with breaking and entering at the headquarters of a major corporation, and she'll kill anyone who gets in her way, be they animal, dinosaur, or human. You straight up gun down treasure hunting rivals Pierre and Larson who, to be fair, are more than happy to open fire on you too. Lara's motivations are primarily selfish. She's initially out for the challenge, thrill, and fun of it, but when Natla, the businesswoman who sent her on the trail in the first place, tries to double-cross her, Lara's motives change to revenge. Natla does believe that, quote, evolution is in a rut, she is trying to force us to adapt and survive in a brutal trial by fire where only the strongest will survive. We are technically saving the world by stopping her, but that's not why we're here. Becoming the saviour of humanity in the process is just a happy accident. Several key elements are changed in the Anniversary Remake, which takes place in a different timeline and continuity. In that game, Lara's deceased father had been searching for the Skion. He believed it could lead him to his missing wife, Lara's mother Amelia. This makes Lara's motivations much more personal, while tying the game's plot into Tomb Raider's Legend and Underworld, forming a narrative trilogy. Here, Lara isn't the same anti-hero, morally grey badass. She doesn't kill Pierre, and Atlantean Centaur takes care of that for her. She's also much more hesitant to gun down Larson, looking at her hands in shock, disbelief, and remorse afterwards. While the details are probably better suited to a dedicated review of Anniversary, I'm not a fan of adding a sense of innocence or a moral high ground to Lara's character. Likewise, Natla's connection to Lara, the revelation of her true identity, and her defeat are all changed in Anniversary. In the original, she commissions Lara to find the Skion simply because Lara's the best there is at what she does. Natla assumes she can simply kill Lara once she's outlived her usefulness, and seems amused when Lara turns up at Atlantis to try and stop her. Natla seemingly views Lara as a gnat, a minor inconvenience, and severely underestimates her. Meanwhile, Anniversary sees Natla reaching out to Lara, having previously worked with her father, Richard Croft. Again, this is ultimately done to tie the game into the plots of Legend and Underworld. Just know that if you're playing the 1996 game, you are in the original timeline and continuity where Lara's parents are very much alive, even attending her funeral in Tomb Raider Chronicles. Lara isn't following in her father's footsteps. His name and profession are entirely different in the original core timeline. She chose to become an adventurer for herself. Hell, her parents have even outright disowned her due to disagreeing with her lifestyle and priorities. The Croft Manor she lives in was supposedly inherited from her aunt instead. She is a spoiled, self-serving rich kid, and that's… fine? It might not be as, quote, relatable, we might not have sympathy for Lara, it might not represent the player, but I would argue that it doesn't have to. This is escapist fantasy after all. Honestly, as much as I prefer 1996's versions of events to anniversaries, the story isn't what brings me back to the original Tomb Raider time and time again. No, what pulls me in is the core gameplay, the unique pacing, the borderline otherworldly aesthetic and atmosphere, the quieter moments, and how the game is happy to leave you alone with itself. It's a feeling that not even the game's own sequels have been able to recapture. The footage in this review probably looks off to you. It's not what most people's memories of Tomb Raider look like. The texture details are different, the colour palette is dark yet saturated with a high contrast, and the lighting even behaves a little differently. 
That's because you are correct on all fronts. My nostalgia is for the Sega Saturn version of the game. This is the release that I grew up with. This is the version that I see when I close my eyes. It's also kind of the worst version, and partway through my playthrough, I regretted my stubborn decision to play what we now know is a rushed to market build. In Europe, the game launched in October of 1996, a full month ahead of its PC and PlayStation counterparts, due to a timed exclusivity deal with Sega. However, Various reports and interviews claim that this deal was either struck or communicated at the last minute. The development team of six, yes, just six people, were already crunching to meet the original release date, so having to finish the game up to six weeks earlier was a daunting prospect. The result is that the Saturn version is considered by many to be incomplete or unfinished. There are minor omissions, Lara can't perform a handstand when pulling herself up from ledges, there are obviously missing textures, and during my playthrough, the game exhibited a visual glitch and then completely shat the bed and crashed entirely. Rebooting my console seemed to fix it, although a minor variant of this error crept its way back in for a short time. The Saturn version also runs terribly, dropping, by my count, as low as 10 frames per second in open areas such as the T-Rex area of the Lost Valley, the arena of the Colosseum, and the main room of the cistern. It's not just the frame rate that suffers, but also the frame pacing, how consistent the timing between the delivery of a new frame is. It forced me to record this 30fps game at 60fps. You would expect new frames to appear on odd numbered frames, 1, 3, 5, etc, with the even numbered frames, 2, 4, 6, just being duplicates. That's not the case, it's instead erratic and seemingly random. You could get, for example, a new frame on frames 1, 3, 4, 7, 9, and 10. It makes the game feel like it's stuttering. It's jarring, preventing you from getting into a rhythm. Worse still, this impacts how responsive your inputs are, with Lara frequently walking off ledges instead of jumping. It can feel like you're battling the game while merely suggesting actions to Lara. Whether she does them or not is a roll of the dice. That's not to say that the Saturn version is irredeemable. Objects underwater distort and sway in a nice graphical effect that's absent from other versions. It also seems to have a greater draw distance, allowing us to see the flaw of St. Francis Folly. While most 3D rendering is done via triangles, the Saturn uses quadrilaterals. This means that the shading, to my eyes at least, looks smoother on Saturn than it does on other platforms. It also lacks the texture warping and differing of its PlayStation counterpart. There is one area where I decided to go against my nostalgia. I grew up with the power release, which runs at 50Hz. It's unoptimized, so it runs around 18% slower than its NTSC 60Hz American and Japanese releases. You can really feel it too, it's like wading Lara through treacle. The trade-off is that the NTSC version stretches the vertical resolution, making everything taller and skinnier. But I just can't go back to that 50Hz speed anymore, and this playthrough used the US 60Hz version. Sadly, if you live in Europe, the PS1 version that you can buy on the PS3 and Vita's digital stores, for however long they stay open, is the slower running 50Hz version. We actually got screwed over on this more often than you might think. Early previews of the revamped PlayStation Plus indicate that the service does use a mix of 60Hz NTSC and the slower 50Hz PAL versions of games, so it's anyone's guess as to what we'll get on there. At the moment, the original Tomb Raider hasn't even been confirmed for the service. Now, watch this very specific part of the video date and age horribly, 
especially as it's taking me a while to get this edited. There are arguments that, as the development team was based in Derby, England, only around three hours from where I live, they would have been aware of this issue. Maybe 50 Hz reflects the game's intended speed. That would be fair, if not for the PC version, which runs at full speed in all territories. You might ask why they didn't optimize the PAL console releases. After all, they were in a PAL territory, so they couldn't claim ignorance as an excuse. I honestly couldn't find an answer for this, so if anyone knows, please educate me in the comments section. I also want to make it very clear that the PAL version of a game isn't always the worst version. PAL copies can have more language options, different voice casts, higher vertical resolutions, and often being the last region to receive a game in the days before patches, even exclusive bug fixes and bonus content like super bosses and extra dungeons. Sadly, in the case of Tomb Raider, the only benefit to the PAL release is having the game displayed in the correct aspect ratio, so the NTSC versions do win out here. The PC version is still available to purchase through Steam and GOG. GOG even offers the first three games in a bundle that regularly drops as low as £1.39. It runs in DOSBox, and the controls are very unusual and uncomfortable. It was certainly an area where 3D gaming was being pioneered, and a standard control scheme hadn't been agreed on yet. I would highly recommend using a controller and X-padder to replicate the PlayStation's control scheme. Here's my configuration again if you want that point of reference. The PC version can be significantly improved with a fan mod that's available through the Steam Workshop. It includes AI upscaled cutscenes, the inclusion of the PlayStation Music, and options for modern resolutions with proper widescreen support. I wouldn't usually include stuff like this in my comparisons, but it is transformative and, in my mind, essential for running the game on modern PCs. It even adds in the four PC-exclusive bonus levels from the unfinished business version of the game. I might look at these separately alongside the similar PC-exclusive levels for Tomb Raiders 2 and 3 at some point. Comparing these four versions side by side, you can see just how different the Saturn version looks, and I maintain that I actually prefer that presentation in-game. It implies the tombs are dark, moist, and crumbling. Where the Saturn takes an objective loss is with the cutscenes. We can see it has a lower color depth, aliased edges, and less clarity. Weirdly, the base PC version displays its cutscenes with scan lines, making them appear darker. Meanwhile, that fan mod really does provide a definitive experience. Let's talk about saving the game. In the PlayStation and Sega Saturn versions, you can only save the game at the single-use save crystals. Note that the PlayStation version flexes here with some real-time reflections for these. Meanwhile, the PC version allows you to save anywhere, anytime, making for an easier adventure. Various sources also state that the Saturn version has fewer save crystals than its PlayStation counterpart making the Sega release somewhat of a hard mode. While capturing footage for this review, my save file actually corrupted when I was about halfway through the game, and I had to restart the entire run. Now, I don't expect that to happen to everyone, and a PlayStation memory card can also get corrupted, but it didn't help my opinion of the Saturn port. Combine those fewer save points with the poor frame rate and unresponsive controls, and you've got yourself an unfairly frustrating and anger-inducing way to play what should be a legendary game. Do not do what I did. As much as I love the aesthetic of the Saturn version, while it is the release I grew up with, I also have to agree it's one of the worst ways to play this game. I would assume that the N-Gage version, which I've not been able to play myself, is worse still due to the limited field of view and control scheme, but hang on, those textures. 
is the Engage port based on the Saturn version. In all seriousness, if you know the answer to that, please tell me in the comments. There were also iOS and Android ports, but they appear to have been delisted, so I've not been able to play those either. Now, I did encounter a surprise at the One Life Left gaming convention in April, a port of the original Tomb Raider running on a Sega Dreamcast. I spoke to Gamesry up at the show, who has more footage of this release on his YouTube channel, and while there isn't a public release of this just yet, another part of the video that may age poorly, it's certainly a project worth keeping an eye on. He told me it's based on Open Lara, an open source version of the original Tomb Raider engine, which is a whole rabbit hole in and of itself. The fan scene, including efforts to port Tomb Raider to the 32X and Game Boy Advance, is massive and could be an entire video in and of itself. All I'll say for now is that it speaks to how much Tomb Raider means to its players. All things considered, I would tell you to grab that PC release and apply the fan mod, which I'll link to in the description. Once again, here's that expatter configuration. It's more than likely how I'll choose to experience my next run of this classic title. I can't talk about the different versions of this game without at least mentioning the remake, which I briefly discussed during the plot summary. In this case, it's more of a reimagining than anything, being significantly different to the original. It's even got a variety of releases across different generations of platforms, with greatly varying levels of fidelity itself. Tomb Raider Anniversary is deserving of its own video, and it will probably get one, but for the people who were typing a comment saying, uh, you forgot the remake, here you go. I absolutely recommend the original Tomb Raider. I think it's essential gaming for anyone who cares about the hobby's history. The controls are going to take some getting used to, and for us Europeans, every version has a but, a caveat, or an inconvenience that prevents there being one definitive release to recommend. That said, I strongly believe those issues are worth putting up with for a unique experience where the pros massively outweigh the cons. If you're a game designer currently working or aspiring, then you owe it to yourself to play the original Tomb Raider. From a level design perspective, I think this should be required reading on the curriculum for any game design course out there. Oh man, this has been another long one, and I'd still bet that after the video goes live, I'll find myself going, ah, I forgot to mention X, Y, and Z. Thank you for watching. Let me know what you think of these much longer form review videos. I purposely tried not to spoil the plot and decided to go against a level by level teardown to preserve the sense of wonder and discovery that comes with your first playthrough of this game, and I hope I struck that balance nicely. For now, I'm going to go take a well-earned nap, I'm an old man, and I'll see you back here for the next video where we'll most likely dissect how Tomb Raider Anniversary's remake went so horribly wrong.